a reading from Letter to the Hebrews. Be careful. The promise of reaching the place of rest God had for the Israelites still holds good. And none of you must think that he has come too late for it. We received the good news exactly as they did. But hearing the message did them no good because they did not share the faith of those who listened. We, however, who have faith, shall reach a place of rest. As in the text, and so in anger, I swore that not one would reach the place of rest I had for them. God's work was undoubtedly all finished at the beginning of the world. As one text says, referring to the seventh day, after all his work, God rested on the seventh day. The text we are considering says, they shall not reach the place of rest I had for them. We must therefore do everything we can to reach this place of rest. For some of you might copy this example of disobedience and be lost. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The response to the psalm is, never forget the deeds of the Lord. The things we have heard and understood, the things our fathers have told us, we will not hide from their children, but will tell them to the next generation the glories of the Lord and his might and the marvelous deeds he has done. Never forget the deeds of the Lord. They too should arise and tell their sons that they too should set their hope in God and never forget God's deeds Keep every one of his commandments. Never forget the deeds of the Lord, so that they might be not like their fathers, a defiant and rebellious race, a race whose heart was fickle, whose spirit was unfaithful to God. Never forget the deeds of the Lord. We can stand to greet the gospel. Alleluia, alleluia. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ enlighten the eyes of our mind so that we can see what we hope his call holds for us. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, word went round that he was back. And so many people collected that there was no room left, even in front of the door. He was preaching the word to them when some people came, bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. But as the crowd made it impossible to get the man to him, they stripped the roof over the place where Jesus was. And when they had made an opening, they lowered the stretcher on which the paralytic lay. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, My child, your sins are forgiven. Now some scribes were sitting there, and they thought to themselves, How can this man talk like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God only? Jesus, inwardly aware that this was what they were thinking, said to them, Why do you have these thoughts in your hearts? Which of these is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, pick, your, pick up your stretcher and walk? But to prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I order you, Get up, pick up your stretcher, and go off home. And the man got up, picked up his stretcher at once, and walked out in front of everyone, so that they were all astounded and praised God, saying, 
We have never seen anything like this. The Gospel of the Lord. Although there are many stories of people in the New Testament of, of Jesus being asked to cure a man's servant, his son, or for some other purpose, the majority of the miracles we hear about are as a result of people appealing personally to him to heal them, the leper, the blind man, the woman with a hemorrhage. Jesus responds directly to them and heals them. Here we have not a person asking to be healed or even speaking to Jesus. Here a group of friends of the paralyzed man have such sheer determination, perseverance, tenacity and ingenuity to have him cured that they go to the extraordinary lengths to do so. It appears that the paralyzed man did or said nothing at all at least until afterwards. This man's cure came about because friends pleaded with Jesus on the man's behalf. Every evening here at Vespers, we pray mostly for others to be cured, helped, encouraged, or kept safe. This is an interesting point that our prayers are so often obviously answered. It is the power of prayer for others that often selfless prayer, a generous prayer, and so often his power becomes evident through that. This should encourage us to be more persistent in prayer, like the man who went to his neighbors late in the night, you remember, and the neighbor said, go away, I'm in bed. As Jesus told us, persistence won him over. But another important constituent in all this is our belief. Belief that there is hope. Belief that the one we are addressing our prayer to really is God, the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. If our belief is faint, then our prayer will be also. Jesus was God in today's story. Jesus remains God in our own stories. He is eternal from beginning to the end. He was not just a good preacher or teacher, as some people try to make out. Not just a good and holy man, but God. And we have to confront our own doubts face to face. We have to believe this fact or reject it. There is no middle way. As C.S. Lewis wrote, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral preacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man that says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil himself. We have to accept the view that he was and is God. It's in our hearts that that comes true. It's in our hearts that our prayers come true, if we believe really. Let us say, with the father of the epileptic son, if you remember, Lord, I believe, help my own unbelief.